Eden, thank you for joining us this Wednesday evening. I'm glad that you are with us. And if you have your Bible, you can turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And what I'd like to do here is focus uh, this week and next week on the last two verses of the chapter, verses 13 and 14. And um, we're talking about uh, having hope in God's goodness. And um, so what we'll do is we'll kind of breeze through the first uh, 12 verses, just kind of get the context, and then really focus in tonight on verse 13, next week on verse 14. And I trust that this will uh, be used the Lord to strengthen your heart, especially in such times as these in which we live. But let's pause for prayer as we begin. Our Father, we uh, come to you tonight um, needing your help, Father, to, to understand your word and to make real life-changing application. Uh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit and his work, and I just pray that we would be uh, yielded and open to, um, Lord, to all that you have for us to glean from this passage. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 27 is one of my favorites. Uh, probably uh, verse 1 is... is uh, one of the most familiar verses in the Psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And uh, uh, as I said, we'll kind of break the first 12 verses down into three sections and just, just touch on them to really get the context of what he's, um, uh, of, of what he's concluding with in the last two verses. And uh, maybe one of these days we'll, we'll preach through the whole psalm. We'll work our way through the whole psalm. But Lord, lay these last two verses on my heart specifically. And I think that, that, um, uh, that he could use them in your heart as well. And so what the, the way I've broken it down, and, and you may see a little differently um, if you were to study the psalm, but I've taken the first section as the first three verses. And so I'm going to read them. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, will I be confident? And the this in which he would be confident refers back to the first, the truth in the first verse. The Lord is his light, and the Lord is his salvation, and the Lord is the strength of his light. And so these first three verses, um, he really uh, zeroes in on the confidence and the safety that he, uh, that he has in the Lord. And uh, of course, he is considering all that God is uh, uh, to, to him personally. Um, his light, his salvation, the strength of his life. And he comes to the conclusion, what do, what do I have to fear if the Lord is these things and if he is these things to me? And so verses 1 through 3 encapsulate uh, really the conclusion to which he's come in the midst of his circumstances. And that's the way that many of these psalms have been written. The first verse or the first couple of verses really are the conclusion of everything that comes after. And uh, it seems to be the same here in this, in this psalm. Verses 4 through 6 uh, make up the second section here. And he says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises 
unto the Lord. And so in verses 4 through 6, he speaks, uh, he speaks of the heart desire and the active pursuit in his life of the Lord. He wants to see the Lord. He wants to dwell where the Lord dwells. He wants to behold the beauty of the Lord. He wants to inquire in his pavilion because, in verse 5, he says, that's where he hides me. He hides me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, uh, he hides me, and he sets me up upon a rock. He gives me a firm foundation there. And uh, he says, and my head is lifted up above my enemies. On that rock on which he sets me, I can look down upon my enemies, and I can know that I'm safe. And I'll offer sacrifices of joy. I'll sing praises unto the Lord, he says. And so he really speaks to the Lord's safety and presence with him in verses 4 through 6. And then in verses 7 through 12, we see the next section. And he writes, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seeking my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, uh, leave me not neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. And so in verses 7 through 12, what we find is his uh, prayer to God expressed. And he has a number of requests that he's making uh, to God. He says, I cry with my voice. Lord, hear me. He requests God's listening ear. Have mercy upon me, he says. Answer me, he says. Um, Hide not thy face far from me, verse 9. Put not thy servant away in anger. Leave me not. Don't forsake me. Verse 11. Teach me thy way. Lead me in a plain path. Verse 12. Deliver me not over in the will of mine enemies. And so... He, he, he cries out to God in verses 7 through 12 and lists his petitions for the Lord. The Lord who is his light and his salvation, the strength of his life, the one who makes him dwell in safety, the one he is seeking after with his whole heart, the one who hides him in the midst of his trouble in his pavilion and sets him up upon a rock in the secret of his tabernacle. This is the God that he petitions in verses 7 through 12. What a beautiful psalm thus far, amen? We're going to focus in on verse 13. And what I'll do is I'll read verses 13 and 14, and then we'll pick apart verse 13 this evening. I have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What I find in verse 13 is a faith-filled expectation. It's a faith-filled expectation because David says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living uh, of the living and what he's saying there is <clears throat> is this idea that i would have fainted i would have become weak discouraged i would have fallen into despair i would have been destroyed if i hadn't believed if i hadn't uh, uh, exercised faith that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so what we have here is a faith-filled expectation. Had David not had faith that God would, dis would display his goodness, David would have fainted. That's what he's saying here. He would have fallen spiritually. Of course, this is the 
aspect of which he's speaking. He's speaking of the spiritual realm. I would have fainted spiritually is David's contention. The key for David, as he viewed all that was wrong around him, was to maintain an eye of faith. We saw uh, back in verses 11 and 12, we saw um, the situation in which he was living. He says in verse 11, Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Verse 12, he says, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies. He says, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. There were people that were after him. There were people seeking to take him down, to destroy him in his life. We find in verse 6, he says, now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies. He talks in verse 12 of the wicked, his enemies and his foes. They came upon him to eat up his flesh, David said. Though an host should encamp against me, he says in verse 3. Though war should rise against me. David was in a difficult spot, a terrifying place in his life. Though we don't know the details, he makes it plain that he was in a place in which he was tempted to fear. Humanly speaking, without God's help, David would have fallen prey to fear, to doubt, to despair, to spiritual fainting. And so the key for David, as he viewed all that was going on around him, all that was wrong in his life, all that were coming against him, the key for him was to maintain an eye of faith. And that's why I call uh, this that we see in verse 13 a faith-filled expectation. He acknowledges that it was his victory over despair, faith that is. He acknowledges that faith was his victory over fainting, over weakness, over despair. Because he said, I had fainted unless I had what? Believed to see the goodness of the Lord. You see that word believe, uh, uh, believed there, referencing the strength of faith. And so faith was his victory over weakness, over fainting. John speaks of this same truth in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, where he writes, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth, there's the faith again, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so faith in God is the victory that overcometh the world, John says. And David says. David says, I would have fainted had I not had faith that I would see God's goodness in the land of the living. You see, a failure in faith, in your life and in mine, brings weakness. There is no strength in faithlessness. There is only weakness. Whenever you feel weak spiritually, you need to look for faithlessness. What am I not believing about God? What is it that God has clearly revealed in the scriptures that I am not having confidence in? Check your source of strength when you're faltering, when you're failing, when you're fainting spiritually. Check your source of strength. What are you depending on 
for your confidence. Because a failure in faith, faith in God, always brings weakness. See, David had an expectation in which he stood firm in faith. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. Though it was hard to see past the darkness that surrounded him, though it was hard to see past the forces that were arrayed against him, he still had faith. He still believed to see the goodness of the Lord. He still exercised trust. Could he see God? No. Could he hear God? Perhaps not. Could he feel God? Could he, could he sense God? Maybe not. But that didn't matter. He exercised trust in God. He believed that he would see the goodness of the Lord. This trust, this faith in which he stood firm was not baseless. His was a faith-filled expectation. And that, uh, and that was because of what his faith was in. He believed, he said, to see or that he would see the goodness of the Lord. And so we see that his expectation, his faith-filled expectation was in God's goodness. God had made, or, or David had made God's goodness his hope. He made God's goodness the thing that he rested his confidence in. Though an host should encamp against me, David says, I believed to see the goodness of the Lord. God's goodness is that quality of kindness and favor that is displayed toward those who love him and fear him. That describes David. David was a man who loved and feared God. And therefore, David could place utmost confidence that he would be able to see God's goodness. It may not have been there in the moment. He may not have seen it, felt it, heard it in the moment. But he knew that he would see God's goodness. That it would be evident, be manifested to him. There is, of course, in God no evil. There is no prejudice. There is no unfairness. God is good. And to David, God's goodness was comforting. God's goodness was comforting to him. He, he knew that God's goodness was always available. That God's goodness never changed. That it never wavered. To David, God's goodness was trustworthy. He knew that it was unending. There was no end of God's goodness. And as long as David loved and feared God, God's goodness could be manifested to him over and over and over again, even to the very end of his life. So to David, God's goodness was comforting. It was trustworthy. It was saving. David knew that in the end, God's goodness would save him from his enemies. He knew that God's goodness was effective to keep him, to protect him, to care for his every need. And that's why he placed his faith in God's goodness. It was a faith-filled expectation. Notice again in verse 13, I had fainted, he says, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. Where? In the land of the living. What is he talking about, the land of the living? Well, that's a good question. The land of the living that David is talking, is talking about could mean in the realm of those who love and fear God, the living, the, the, those who have spiritual life. 
It could simply mean, the, by the land of the living, he could simply mean uh, on this earth, among mankind. He could mean that he had faith that he would see the goodness of the Lord before he died. The land of the living. Regardless, we see the truth that he was expecting to see the goodness of God in the place where God works. And so we can look at this phrase in the land of the living just in terms of this is where God is at work. God's goodness is revealed in the land of the living, in that place where he is at work. Now this goodness of God has a couple of implications for the believer. It goes, this, this idea, this, this truth, this characteristic or attribute of God, God's goodness has implications in his dealings with his children. When God deals with his children, he deals in goodness. God defines goodness, and goodness is defined by God. And when God deals with his people, he deals in goodness. But it also goes to his purpose for us. The goodness of God goes to the very purpose that God has for his people. God's purpose is always only good. It never has any tinge or any aspect or any quality of anything other than goodness. There is never anything nefarious, never anything evil. There is never anything that is not the best in God's purpose for each of our individual lives. God's goodness goes, number one, to his dealings with us, number two, to his purpose for us. We'll look at verse 14 next week, which is really the conclusion that he comes to. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. This is the real application that he has come to in his life because of his faith-filled expectation that one day, might be tomorrow, might be a week from now, might be two months from now, maybe a year from now, he would see God's goodness in relation to all that he was going through. So I want to encourage you this week to look for God's goodness to depend upon God's goodness. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know the circumstances that are bearing down a, 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 a upon you. I don't know the pressures that you may be under. But I do know one thing. I know that you can have utmost confidence. You can have a confident expectation by faith that you will see God's goodness if you fear and love God. He will manifest his good nature to you. And I hope you find confidence in that. I hope you find encouragement. And I hope you find a peace for your heart in that truth. God is only always good. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you would take these truths and that you would, Lord, bury them deep within our hearts. And in the midst of life as we know it, in the midst of our individual personal circumstances, in the midst of all that is going on in our nation, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to refocus our attention, our hearts upon 
your goodness. Help us, dear God, to exercise faith, trust, confidence in the fact that you will reveal your goodness to us personally as we seek you as David sought you. As we see you as our light and our salvation and the strength of our life. And as we refuse to fear what man can do unto us, Lord, help us, we pray. We need you, and we thank you for the encouragement in these uh, scriptures tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good night.